Welcome back to Africa This Week with me, Adam Aminu. Before the break, we looked at South Sudan and its bid for lasting peace in the country. But now we'll be moving on to our next segment, Ruby on the News. To discuss the articles I have with me, um, Sister Nusrat Luda, who is a writer and a blogger, and we have Khadija Mahmoud, who is also a freelance journalist. So we've had some really interesting um, stories um, in the media at the moment, and the first one that we're going to be discussing is Ghana Web. Um, the story looks at a recent graduate from um, from Ghana, who joined the Islamic State group in Syria and Iraq. Um, he was 25 years old, and I believe he had a degree in geography and rural studies as well. I wanted to ask um, you, starting with you, Nusra, what did you think about the, the article? I thought about the article about how we often assume that when a person is a recruit of ISIS, that they must come from um, a Muslim-majority country or that they must be radicalized from the West. And we know that generally, because of the democratization of the media, we find that because people now have access to all these different materials and websites, it's easier to get recruited in terms of, rad in terms of being radicalized in such a sense. Now, this poses a problem as well. When such people do go off to um, ISIS and when they do come back, what kind of measure do we take? It's, it comes with its own set of challenges. Do we rehabilitate them? Do we take more punitive measures? And it just shows that actually, when we're thinking of the issue of radicalization and extremism, we shouldn't narrow our paradigms. We should be more broad thinking regarding this issue. Well, what should we really make of this? I mean, this is a guy who comes from Ghana, which is known to be a um, majority Christian country. And I think it would have shocked a lot of people, particularly. Um, what do you make of this, sister? I mean, I think it definitely highlights the, the fact that it's not just young people in the West that are being targeted, and that's a misconception that the media often does portray. So if anything, this is more of a reality check. And just to sort of reiterate that, if you're a young person, you are at risk, full stop. There's no ifs, buts, or maybes. And I think it's a reality check, as horrible as it sounds. I mean, it's very sad looking at the article, the way he left. He, he, left, he said that he'd lied to his, his yeah. parents. Um, we actually had a, a video showing in the previous segment um, the sort of despair in his, his, his mother's face. Um, and there was that confusion as to how he could have possibly gone on to, 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 to such a journey um, to go to the Islamic State group um, in Syria and Iraq. And it does bring about the question about what social media does and the role it plays in this, in this whole issue, doesn't it? Social media generally plays a very pivotal role in our interactions, whether it's telling somebody that, hey, I'm going to the shop to buy some milk, or actually propagating ideas. Now, what um, play, um, things such as, for example, of social media on phones um, and also on the web have played a significant role. But what plays also another role is interpretation of text. Because some people have literal interpretations of text or, or have been done in a way that's warped, uh, particularly when you are young and impressionable, you will take it as being the literal thing. And because of that, it will spur you on to do something in the name of, at least in your own conception, of pleasing Allah, which we know generally um, with regard to um, indiscriminate killing, that that's not from the teachings, or at least within the orthodox mm. teachings of Islam. Absolutely. Well, we're going to go on to our next, our next article, which was from Reuters Africa, and it's with respect to Ethiopia. Um, 4.5 million Ethiopians need aid after failed rains. Um, and so um, UN agencies and organizations have stated that um, they, will need, uh, they will need an extra 230 million pe uh, pounds to, to cover um, giving aid to Ethiopians as a result of failed rains um, by the end of the year. What did you make of that article? I mean, Africa as a whole, as a continent, mm -hmm. it's very vulnerable to climate change. So when you combine that alongside the developmental challenges that many African states um, experience, such as um, internal conflict and poverty, it really does highlight that there is a risk when it comes to African economy. And that in terms of what can be done, I think there's still a question mark around that. Absolutely. So. What about yourself, Ms. Rett? I think that when we look at the issue of um, the vulnerability of African economies, because they're still developing, sometimes the response to these um, natural cause um, um, disasters are not always adequate. Now, this is also exacerbated by um, socio-political factors, geopolitical factors, and just trying to respond to getting by for the next day. Now, what I think we can do um, is to pull the resources together, but but not in a way that's detrimental to Africa, as we see IMF loans, which may, for, for at least for that moment, 
uh, respond to the immediate problem, but what about long term? You're indebting Africa, and Africa has so much to give in terms of business. It's a, it's a place of enterprise, as we know it. It's an untapped market. It's only just about IMF loans because, I mean, this is an agricultural weather issue. The El Nino phenomenon um, has caused this, and for those who don't know, the El, El Nino phenomenon um, causes um, harsh weather to, 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 to scale across the East Africa and Asia, and it causes flooding in South America. This isn't something exactly that anyone can actually have, whether you have as many loans or not. Maybe the answer is with agricultural uh, sort of development. But the Aromia region is known to be a very sort of diverse region with valleys and so forth. It prompts us, uh, that's a very good point. It also prompts us as well in the way that we take care of the environment. But that's also, the, but the onus on taking care of the environment is not just within Africa. We see even within the way places in the US manage um, the environment, we shouldn't be using resources and taking and be doing things like recycling and renewable energies instead of just relying on, on the core sources. Absolutely, okay, well our um, third uh, article was on, from OK Africa. Um, Afro Anim series looks to tap into the emerging market of African magical futurism. So basically, this was a, an article looking at two brothers, um, the Odiogranya brothers, they're from Nigeria, but they're based in America. And um, as graphic designers, they've created um, these this series looking at um, three African kids who are um, mystically taken away into a different realm where they help a peacekeeping force um, that helped to prevent a war between ancestral Africa and neo-Africa. Um, it was very interesting video because there's a video at the end of the article there. Um, one of the interesting things that I, I, I thought was, was really cool about the article was that they said that they hadn't seen um, other examples out there that you know, people of ethnic minorities could be inspired by. Growing up in the 90s, we had Marvel heroes like X-Men, yeah. the Incredible Hulk, um, but none of them we could really relate to. Yeah. What did you think about Khadija Mohammed? I mean, I definitely would say it's such a relief to know mm. that there's a show coming like this where a lot of young black kids feel that, you know, actually, oh, I can relate to them. And I think, it, you know, Africa has such a rich culture and history, and it's a very untapped market. You have... Um, you know, shows companies like Disney and Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network who tend to kind of reuse the same material over and over again. So congratulations to these two brothers for tapping into the market that obviously a lot of other companies have failed to do so. I mean, what's, do you think this is something that is a really great educational platform for, for young African children or people from the, from the ethnic minority diaspora? I, I think it is a very good educational platform because we know that education takes place in various forms, particularly for young children who generally tend to learn through seeing and through imagery and audio, and audio um, hearing as well. I think it shows a different, I think it's good because it's showing phys, in its physical form different images than they're used to seeing. For example, there was one article I was reading called Critiquing, um, in terms of um, Africa, Critiquing um, Western Narratives Regarding Africa, where Africa is always seen as being dependent, backward, um, or so, so called backward culturally, or just stagnant in every direction. So to see this kind of, um, these kind of images portrayed, not only to children, because we know that adults may watch this as well, it's empowering young children to believe that yes, you can be the hero in, 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 a, in a story, as opposed to being the first guy that gets killed in a film, or the, or the guy's best friend, as we see in many films um, that, that have black people within that. So I think it's a very good thing, and I hope to generally see more. Um, just coming back to the point about the, the, the difference between ancestral Africa and neo Africa, because sometimes there can be that tension that we see sometimes in politics. Mm. How important do you think it is about? How do you important? How important do you think it is to address um, that kind of transition? I think it's vital because there's a lot of misconceptions about Africa, as you said, mm. in general. So with kids, you can't give them a textbook or you know a long essay. It's broken down for them in a fun, interactive way, and at the same time, you're promoting, mm. you know, African values, history, and it really does, I think, relate and engage. It is engaging to a lot of kids. I think it's really engaging for yeah. people who were born, perhaps, in Britain or in yeah. the Western world, who don't necessarily yeah. have that connection, perhaps, exactly. with Africa, particularly. The, the diaspora so. generally yeah. would benefit very much from this. I mean, Definitely. that sometimes when we are abroad, we can have that sense of of being, I guess, what people back home would say, lost, because mm -hmm. sometimes we are so far removed. So this is a good way to actually build that bridges. 
for those kind of bridges, sorry, yes. Absolutely. Mm. Okay, well, our last article is from The Guardian, um, and it looks at, um, again, the concept of image and beauty. Mm. South African black doll breaks the Barbie mold in style. So this was an interesting um, article um, relating to an entrepreneur who is trying to break into this market. I know there, The Guardian tends to cover a lot of these stories yeah. about dolls. I mean, there was a recent article that looked at dolls that are being um, manufactured with particular disabilities to kind of get to grips with this kind of perfect image which doesn't necessarily exist. What did you think about this particular article and what this, this woman's trying to do? I think it's amazing. For once you have young girls who when they look at the media they see a reflection of themselves and it really does highlight the diversity within the media. Um, and the interesting thing is actually this isn't the first black doll. They've existed for a very long time and for them to actually look appealing, dress appealing and still, you know, racially and physically and have their hair, their hair and everything representing black, beautiful women. Mm -hmm. I think as a young girl, that's, detrim that's detrimental to their sort of perceptions of what beauty is, really. Absolutely. It's also, I think it's a very good initiative because it's showing the black woman in her natural form. And particularly as it's done in South Africa, it will help me um, kind of bring to light this issue of the fact that whenever we do see dolls, they're not, not everyone is white. So it ameliorates misconceptions that people may have regarding the image of black women. And as well, it's also very empowering to see somebody, that, a doll that actually looks like you. Um, there was a, an experiment done on the Tyra Bank show, actually, showing how because there was a lack of um, black dolls in the market, that some children thought that, that they could, that. yeah, they could only represent, um, that the only doll that they could relate to was one that at least had European features and that didn't represent them. And if they asked which, which doll that they liked the most, it was the one that was white or one that was closest to European features. And a lot of them were ashamed of the fact that they were even black and had uh, Afro hair. Image is very central to mm. all of this as yes. well because one of the things that um, the, the entrepreneur wants to do is actually um, get the children to have matching clothes with the Barbie so she could yeah. kind of sort of get that link and that connection as well. Um, it's very interesting because obviously growing up we had Barbie dolls. I don't yes. know if everyone has iPads yeah. now, yeah. but um, we had Barbie dolls and we, you know, it, what it did to our psyche to only see a Barbie doll with Caucasian features mm. was a little bit. Um, sort of uh, demoralizing at times and even it? sort of culturally mm. in a lot of African cultures it's reinforced that you know um, black hair in its natural form mm. is something that needs to be tamed why and then you have these images that kids are constantly being bombarded with mm. in the media so you have um, it might not you know be a quick thing but it's a gradual process and we need to remember that the media is such a powerful tool so we need to be able to utilise it in a positive manner and I think that's what this woman's doing. So well, thank you so much for, for your comments and um, your opinions as well on the articles. Um, we'll be having a short break but soon afterwards we're going to be looking at whether or not black is truly beautiful and whether skin whitening is really a problem. To find out what our guests have to say, we'll see you in three.